Um, so, this talk is going to be about old code patterns in Python, both real and mythical code patterns, uh, or code patterns that aren't actually old. Uh, because the standard patterns in Python has changed throughout time, because Python has gained more features. So I'm going to start off with a pattern about dictionaries, and this one is a fairly common pattern. When you have a lot of values per key, uh, every value in your dictionary should be list or set or tuple. It's very common to do this, or another dictionary, or anything mutable, in fact. And then you would today use a default dict like this. Because with the default dict, essentially, if you access a key that doesn't exist, it will just create it for you. So you can just pick out the value, and in this case it's a set, and add things to that set. And you can be sure that the key exists. But that only landed in 2.5. So how, what did you do before this? Well, very simple. You did your check manually, right? So you look if the key exists in the dictionary. And if it does, you add the value to the set, and if it doesn't, you create the set with the value. And the question might be why you need to recognize this pattern, because after all, this is old and outdated, right? And exists only in unmaintained code, like Django 151. <laughs> because this code once supported Python 2.4, and it doesn't anymore, but nobody changed it until I did this talk at DjangoCon earlier this year. So next version, uh, which is apparently coming out in a couple of weeks, I don't know if they're going to fix this, but they will fix a couple of the things that I mentioned. Uh, some of them were actually fixed by the end of my talk. Um, and you might think that they are doing this because the clever core developers of Django know something we don't. Maybe the default tick is slower. So I benchmarked that and it isn't. It's a little bit faster. So that's that's not the reason. It's just because um, that there haven't been any bugs in that code, so nobody has changed it. But using default tick will mean you have less code and less bugs, and it's also faster, except in Jython. Uh, you might notice that Iron Python is missing here, and that's because I couldn't get Iron Python working reliably on Mono. Um, so I, I don't have benchmarks for Iron Python because I could only benchmark a couple of the things. Iron Python is is very strange. What about set default then? Because that existed before. You can use set default. Um, but set default is misnamed. It sounds like it sets a default, but it doesn't. It gets something. And if that doesn't exist, then it sets a default. Um, so therefore, it's kind of the naming is confusing. So a lot of people don't know what it is. And I tended to forget what it does a lot of times before I actually uh, had used it a couple of times. Um, but also, what is more important here is that uh, you'll see that it will create a set every time you call it. Every time you use it, you have to create a new set. And uh, that's slow. So it doesn't really work very well in those cases where you need something mutable. It works in these kind of cases where you're um, not going to have a, a mutable object, but maybe a, um, a counter or something. Then set default works fine. OK, enough about default dict. Let's talk about the standard dictionary. Because it has also changed quite a lot. There's a lot of uh, the things that today is obvious and everybody uses that that's uh, for somebody that has been doing Python a long time still is a little bit new. Uh, and the most common outdated things you are likely to encounter are keys and has keys, the two methods. And you might say that keys is not outdated, but it is. Up to Python 2.1, you had to use keys to get a list of the keys. So if you wanted to loop over the keys of a dictionary, you had to do this, 4x in my dict keys. And today you would, of course, just do 4x in my dict. Uh, because this avoids creating a separate list object, so you don't use up memory for the list object. You can use iter keys as well, which is very similar, but there's really no point to doing that, especially since iter keys is gone in Python 3. So you can then your code doesn't run on the Python 3. 
Uh, under Python 3, of course, keys does not create uh, a list. But under Python 2, it does. So if you want still to use Python 2, you shouldn't use keys. Um, so therefore, you should do this just for x in my dict. And the same goes for making a list of keys. The old way is to call keys. And you'll find this, and a lot of people are still doing this because you're used to it and you're used to seeing this kind of code. But Python 3 doesn't uh, return a list when you call keys anymore, so you can't do that. So the best way to uh, create a list out of the keys is to uh, pass in the dictionary uh, as, a, to the, as a parameter to the list constructor. And this works in both Python 2 and Python 3, but not Python 2.0. Same thing for has key. Today you would just do if x in my dict, of course. Um, this is not so common that you see that in new code. People have learned this at least. Okay, enough about dictionaries. Now let's talk about sets. Sets are useful and the values in a set must be unique and lookups are fast, although they're not ordered, or at least they're not ordered in a way that's useful for us, especially in the last, latest versions of Python 3, where, um, in fact, the ordering of a set and also of a dictionary may, be, may change each time you start Python. And sets first appeared in Python 2.3 as a standard library module and as a type in Python 2.4, a built-in type in Python 2.4. So what did you do before? What else do you have that has unique values, fast lookup and no ordering? Yes, exactly. You use dictionary keys instead of sets. So this, I lied, this pattern is also about dictionaries. <laughs> Uh, this code example makes a list unique by putting it into a dictionary as keys with value of none. And then getting a list of keys back. And I could not, to my disappointment, find any example of this in Django. Um, or anywhere else, really. It's, kinda, it's very old. Um, and another usage of dictionary keys like this is when you want to do very fast lookups. Uh, Checking if a value exists in a dictionary is way, way faster than checking if it exists in a list. It's, um, well, I don't remember how big this list is. I think maybe it's a thousand items or maybe it's 10,000. I don't remember. But if you have a big list, um, looking it up in a dictionary is much faster than in a list. Um, of course, today you would use sets, which are a little bit faster still. But before you would use um, dictionaries. So if you see people doing these weird kind of things with dictionaries and having none as values only, this is either for speed or because it's written before, well, it's because it's written before sets and it's either for speed or to make something unique. And we'll find an example of this in this code, although this is about something else as well, because it's enough with dictionaries now. And let's talk about sorting instead. And this is also from Django 151. And it makes several mistakes. First of all, it is using a set to make a list um, unique. And that's kind of pointless, because it creates a list first, and then it extends that with values, and then it makes it into set to make it unique and turns it back into a list. So this is a typical example of somebody has made this first with a list, right? And then somebody else have gone, oh, but this list needs to be unique and just make it set and back it to a list without actually looking at the rest of the code and realizing that they could just use a set from the beginning. So I'll refactor this before. They sort it and then return it, the list. I'll refactor this. That was two slides. Here we go. Uh, to use a set from the beginning to make it a little bit clearer. So here it uses a set, extend that, and then it makes it a list to sort it. Because of course sets are practically unordered. Uh, they're not sorted by value, that's for sure. So it creates a list sorts the list and returns it. And that might be okay, you think, but the point here is that you could use sorted instead. 
this avoids creating this first list and then sorting it, instead it creates a sorted list directly, will be marginally faster, but more importantly there's less code, there's less lines, so there's less bugs. And in this case, or especially in the earlier case, in this case we know it's a set, right? And the earlier case we knew it was a list because the line before we sorting it, sorted it was making it into a list. But if you're sorting things that are coming in as parameters to a function, um, you may know that you always call it with a list, but somebody else might call it with a tuple or with a set or anything else. And sorted will accept all of these and that makes your code less susceptible to other people's misuse. You'll know for sure that it, it works better. Uh, and that makes the code more robust. And calling sort on an existing list is a little bit faster than calling sorted on the list, as it ends up creating a new list. Um, but the difference is quite small. <coughs> The next old sorting pattern is all about speed, and this is nothing you'll find in Django 1.5 because it doesn't even work under Python 3. So this example is from Plone, and it's even an old version of Plone. Uh, this is Plone 4.0, I don't remember right now when it was released, but it's uh, several years old. Uh, after that, they, it was fixed. And first, uh, you'll see here that this is clearly code from when Plone still supported Python 2.3. It's actually this code must be written before Python 2.4 because it calls the variable sorted, which is now a built-in. Now this works fine, but any editor that with the syntax highlighting would say, but don't use that, you'll get a different color on the variable. Um, so this is, this is really old code. It also makes a copy of the list that it wants to sort. And it does this because it doesn't want to actually sort the original list, it will re want to return a sorted list. So this is all good indications that this code, code is really old. Um, but I've already covered sort versus sorted, so for clarity I'll refactor this code to use sorted instead to show what the, this actually is about. And here we have the code with sorted, see, much smooth, much, much shorter, much easier. And I also refactored out the comparison function in the sort into a separate function, also for clarity. So what it's doing here is that it will take and compare two values in this list, and it will sort them on modified dates. But the comparison method compares pairs of object, and the longer the list is, the more pairs are possible. So, uh, in an old uh, uh, version of a Python magazine, an old issue of Python magazine, which is sadly defunct, it was pretty good at the end, uh, a guy called Jared Hardy did statistics on this. So this is his statistics. And if you have 40,000 items in the list, you'll get an average of 342,000 calls to the comparison method. And that's eight and a half calls per item in the list. But since Python 2.4, we can sort with a key function instead. So this is much easier, as you see. And this must be a different version of Firefox, because this box ended up in a completely wrong place. This works on my computer, but yeah. So this just returns, the key function should only return something that is sortable, right? A sortable value. So this returns the modified date. And uh, then you get an average of exactly one call per item to this. So it's always less calls. And uh, we get 40,000 instead of 350,000 calls. It's one seventeenth the amount of calls in a list that's 40,000 long. Uh, the calls are also, uh, in turn, faster. Because you only get the modified date uh, once instead of twice in the key function as compared to the compare function. So this sorting is going to take at least, it's going to be at least 10 times fast. So this is one of the things you should 
change if you really find this. You don't not only need to understand what a comparison method does in sorting, uh, you need to change it because it's going to be much faster. Next, uh, conditional expressions. You might have seen this, this is very common. Um, and this looks like it's a logic expression because it has a lot of ands and ors, or it has an one and and one or. So it looks like a logic expression, but it isn't. It's a sneaky conditional. And it means that if include blank is true, then first choice gets set to blank choice. Otherwise, it's an empty list. But there's a big problem with this. Blank choice, in this case, is a parameter. So what if something uh, is passed in as blank choice that evaluates to false, like none or an empty set or an empty string? Well, first choice will be an empty list. Whatever you do, first choice is going to be an empty list. Uh, this example from Django, it's not an important issue because a blank, blank choice makes no sense. Uh, but it should really result in an error. You should get an error message and you don't. So that's why, after much nagging, Guido accepted conditionals. And he did that exactly because people would use this kind of sneaky conditional instead. So even though he apparently didn't really like the syntax of one-line conditionals, people would use them anyway, so it got implemented. And this is Python 2.5 and later. And here, First choice gets to set to blank choice if include blank is true, or it gets else it gets sent to an set to an empty list. And here it does not matter what if blank choice is evaluating to false or not. And now we don't have that many patterns left, but they're going to take a little bit longer to go through. Um, and this is a pattern that was suggested to me. I asked for old patterns because I first said, oh, this is going to make a good lightning talk. And then everybody says, no, it's going to make a good talk. And I said, well, yeah, I've only got like four patterns. So people started suggesting patterns to me. And this is one of them that was suggested. And I wasn't going to actually bring it up because I didn't think it was very interesting until I started benchmarking it. And here we see something very simple. I'm calculating a constant outside of the loop. That makes sense, right? Because otherwise, if it's inside the loop, it had to be calculated every time in the loop. So that's kind of silly to do that. But I'm then told that in Python 2.5, Python will recognize that this is a constant and it won't calculate it every time. So let's take a look at that and see, yes. Exactly, Python 2.4, having the calculating this constant inside the loop will slow the loop down. In Python 2.7, it will not. Uh, Jython, it will still slow it down a little bit. PyPy, of course, is very fast with this code. It's 30 to 40 times faster than Python 2.7 because it will just realize that it can optimize away pretty much all of it. Um, but if we instead have a division instead of a multiplication, Python 2.7 does no longer recognize that this is a constant. Python 3 works and PyPy, they're still fine. And of course, this example is stupid. 5 times 3.5 is 17.5, so I could just replace it with 17.5. And, and, and PyPy is really, really fast because it realizes that you can actually do this. So that this is more or less what PyPy does in this case. It just goes, ah, oh, this is easy, donk, and it replaces all of it. So um, we'll have to do a little bit less stupid version here. In this case, it's a constant from the loops point, right? Five times a, a variable is going to be the same for each iteration of this loop. So from the loops point of view, it's a constant. But a variable, a var is a variable, so it will change for different types you, when you call the function. So what happens then? Well, Python 3.3 again does not recognize that this is a constant and will not optimize it away, but PyPy will.
unless you use a power in the calculation of the constant where pi pipes optimization also disappears. So on PyPy, it's now 33 times faster to calculate this constant outside of the loop. Because PyPy no longer can realize, that, oh, I can just take the length of this. So what actually it turns out here is that this pattern, that calculating the constants outside of the loop, it's not a prehistoric pattern after all. You should calculate constants out of side of the loop. Because different implementations of Python um, will recognize that it's a constant in different cases. So it's better to just calculate it outside and not rely on the implementation to do this for you. And that's good, of course, because that's what you would do naturally anyway. And here's another prehistoric pattern. And this was what actually started the whole thing. You'll hear a lot of people claiming that concatenating strings with plus is slow and doing join is faster. And we see an example of this here in Django 151. It makes a list out of two strings and it joins them instead of doing a plus. And you'll find people on Stack Overflow saying that you shouldn't use plus for concatenating strings because it's slow. And then you'll find somebody else saying, oh yeah, but that's not true after point Python 2.5 and later, because now Python 2.5 will recognize this. And then somebody says, oh, but PyPy won't. So you should still use join. And this has even been a discussion on, um, on Python dev going exactly this way. So let's look at the benchmarks. And we'll actually see <coughs> that using plus or add, which is what's going on on the behind, is faster than join on every case except PyPy when concatenating two strings. So this is a, some sort of big misunderstanding. Um, it seems like the optimizations that were done in Python 2.5 doesn't actually make that much of a difference. A little bit, but not much. And I think this is just a big misunderstanding. And the misunderstanding comes from this. If you have a long list or iterable of strings and you want to join them together, you can do that by looping over this and then adding them onto a result string. But it's going to be very slow. Doing join like this instead is going to be very fast, comparatively. Um, let's look at the numbers. I don't remember how. I think this is a list of strings that between 0 and 999 characters long, if I remember correctly. I don't know. So you'll see here that add is now much slower than join in this case, except on PyPy, which will recognize what you're doing and optimize it away. And the reason for this is that you get many copies, right? If you go through and think what's happening here is that the first iteration, it will take the first string uh, as the text variable. It will then copy the contents of that string over to the result variable. And then the next iteration, it will take the contents of the result variable, which is now the first item, and copy that over to the new result variable, and then copy the second item over. And in the third iteration, it will copy the result variable, which now is the first item and the second item, and then it will copy over the third item. So if you have a thousand items in this list, the first item will be copied a thousand times in memory. In this case, sorry, in this case, each item in the list will be copied exactly once from one location to another location in memory. And that's why join is faster when you're um, looping over. So the misunderstanding here that in this case, you also get each variable copied only once. Right. So this is not slower than this. In fact, this is slightly slower because you're creating a list that you're then throwing away. So it's a little bit slower. So when to use what? 
If adding strings are fast when you're adding two strings and slow when you're adding a lot, where is the break point? And um, it depends. It depends on how long the strings are and it depends on how many strings you are. And it seems like with typical cases of not too long strings or uh, and not too long strings, I'm talking about several thousand characters, join is faster somewhere around four to five strings at CPython. With PyPy, up to 10 strings are still as fast to use as additions, but I stopped testing there because it was getting silly because I don't want to type in 10 variable names in a row. So the conclusion is that you should do what feels natural. If the easiest way to concatenate a bunch of strings is by using plus, then do that. If the strings that you have should be uh, put into another string, so to speak, that there's a lot of formatting strings that goes in between, then use format or the percent sign. They're about the same speed. But if you have a list of strings, or they're generated in a loop or something, then you use join, which is the natural thing to do at that point. And the same thing with calculating constants outside of the loop. It feels like it should be faster. Sometimes it's not, sometimes it is. But the correct thing to do is to do what feels natural, putting it outside of the loop. And I think, and this is my conclusion, is that Python is such a fantastic language to a large extent because what intuitively feels like the right way to do things in Python is in fact the right way to do things in Python. You don't have to overthink it. If you have a list of things, of strings, and you want to join them, then you use join. If you have two strings and you want to add them, you use add. That's, that's the correct thing to do everything. Um, and I think that maybe that's what you can actually get away with from this talk in the end, is that Python is a very natural language to use, and that's why it's good. Thank you. So, questions? Um, so maybe uh, you, you spoke uh, a little about performance of particular solutions. So, for example, uh, could you tell maybe something about uh, using the cost of using absolute imports uh, when you are doing like import foo.bar.acme and then you use it uh, this particular uh, name. So for each of the components, it, it has to do a get at on the module, right? Yeah, right. I, I haven't I haven't looked at the speed of that, but yes, uh, it's it's true that uh, you uh, have using using long paths for attribute for imports. That if you have a module that is very popular in Plone and Soap, for example, to have things that's called uh, Plone App Toolbar dot Browser dot something, and if you call it like that, that is slightly slower. Uh, Yes, so you'll see also that that's um, a, a quite common pattern is that if you if you have that if you're doing a lot of if you if you're in the middle of a very tight loop, people sometimes set a variable to the function that is going to be called in there, so you don't have to do a module lookup on that function every time. So that is slightly faster, yes. So, uh, but I don't have any numbers on how much faster it is. Uh, do you think that it's possible that there were some optimiza optimizations done for that? Yeah, it's possible. I don't know if there is. I, 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 don't, I, haven't, I don't have any memory of seeing that there was optimizations, but it's possible. Thanks. Hero. Yeah, it's true. Um, I, no, I don't have any policy of that in general. Um, 
because we 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 did have bugs like that in pro like that in project uh -huh, and okay. from then we started to um, mapping default dict to dict every time you ret return but uh -huh. but okay. the, it's it costs cpu yeah um yeah, no, I can see that. I mean, in in a, in a generic module, if you're having a, if you're writing a third-party library uh, and you're returning a default dict, yeah, I could see that people get confused that they don't realize that they get a, actually a default dict back, and they uh, try to use it as a normal dict and try to look if something exists in it and st stuff like that, uh, and then. Uh, you'll get bug. I can, bugs, I can see that. I don't think that's a problem if you're doing it internally, but for a, for a library, I can see that this happens. Um, on the other hand, people would then get bugs and it would behave differently and then you'll have to maybe require of them to actually read the documentation or something. So it's, it's a little bit the part of we're all adults here that, you know, you're supposed to know what you're doing, kind of, when you're using third-party libraries. So, um, I don't know, I don't have any good recommendation there. Okay. Thanks. Anybody? Okay, I wanted to ask a question. Okay. Actually, it's a little bit of trolling, so excuse me. Uh, so, you used uh, speed as the, as the way to compare those patterns and this is a very convenient uh, metric because you can measure it easily but it's not very useful is it yeah well um yeah i mean I, I lo when you compare these different patterns um a lot of it i mean it's is a matter of taste of what you want to do right so um when it comes to the strings here, the uh, claim from the start is that using concatenating is slow, so there I used benchmarking, and that's why I started to do it, uh, to compare different ways to show that this was not actually true, uh, or actually to discover that it wasn't true, because I didn't know it before I tried. Um, and uh, for many of the others, it it's not speed might not be the major issue uh, for comparison for sorting i think it is i mean you should use the key function there not only because it's faster but also because it's uh, easier uh, and um, then also creates less bugs but so most of these patterns the the overriding thing actually the most important thing is that you should use the pattern that has the less uh, lines of code because that is usually means that you get less bugs um, so that's a good um, like a rule of thumb to do that and it turns out that generally in Python that also means that it's fastest uh, but of course you shouldn't you sh so you shouldn't really think about what is fastest when you're writing it necessarily. You should do what's easiest. That's always this the old thing that uh, any optimization done without benchmarks is premature. And again, that's you know why Python is so good because if you write the code that is going to be the shortest and clearest and easiest to read, it will have less bugs and it will often, not always, but most of the time also be the fastest way of doing it. Um, it's just when you're getting into very tight loops and very specific things that, that you can do uh, magic tricks and uh, it's very unusual that that you get that problem. Um, there is actually a very nice and long talk which is called something like how to speed up your Python program 10,000 times or something like that which goes into um, how somebody is speeding up his code a lot, first by using um, uh, Cython and then looking into what actually the compiler is doing, the C compiler is doing. And it's very, very complex. There's lots of layers going on. So you, you might end up doing that if you want to really, really speed some tight loops up. But um, in general, for the most kind of generic Python program, programming, less lines means less bugs and faster. 
Hey, one more question. What about the all-time favorite of uh, what is faster, op in operator or catching a key error? I've seen. That oh right, I have. Time. I benchmarked that, but I forgot. I I think in operator is slightly faster. Yeah, but because I I know I tested this because it was also some years ago. Some bottom stack overflow. I think I've um, heard that uh, the in operator is faster if the key is there. Uh, no, it if, could be something yeah. like that, yeah. And if uh, the key is there, the exception is faster, and the, when it isn't there, the in operator is faster. Something like yeah, that. Yeah, it could be something like that. Yes, yes, that sounds familiar. So, um, <laughs> so that uh, there again, I would recommend the in operator because that's easier to read than having a try except. Uh, but again, then you might want to change that if you actually benchmark it and you figure out that in your case an accept would be faster. But um, as a generic rule, the in operator is easier to read. Okay, we have no more questions, I think. So thank you very much for the talk. Thank you. Thank you.